heed my words. I am Melania, Blade of Mikola. Melania, Blade of Mikola, Blade of Mikola, 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 Mikola. Together. No. No. Please no. This video contains both spoilers and speculation and assumes you have finished the game at least once. Turn back now, ye tarnished, lest ye be spoiled. <sighs> In order to understand Mikola, as per usual, we will start with his name. Mikola is actually the feminine form of Michael and could be used as an alternate to Michelle or Michaela. Mikola means one who is like God or who is like God or the one who passes the message of God. My research suggests it has origin in Judaism or the Catalan people of Spain. This particular screenshot suggests it could be of English origin, but I have found no evidence of this from anywhere else. The name makes perfect sense for this character, considering not only is Mikola the son of a singular god as an Empyrean, but he was also the most likely to have become a god. No matter where it comes from, the name is almost always feminine in nature. This is rather strange at first glance, but it actually makes a lot of sense, Firstly due to Mikola's form being rather feminine in the intro cinematic, but perhaps more interestingly considering the duality of Marika and Radagon, which we'll go over later in this video. Mikola was born to Radagon and Marika, and he, much like his twin sister Melania, was born afflicted. Melania's affliction was Scarlet Rot, whereas Mikola's was Eternal Youth. I will mention now that they were both born in Pyrians, which means that they were intended to become gods. We'll talk more about that later. Melania, firstly, was an extremely important influence on Mikola's life, mostly as a driving force for his research. Mikola wanted more than anything else to cleanse his sister of the rot and the outer god that had gotten its claws into her. His first avenue of trying to fix her was his father and the Golden Order. Radagon was an extremely important character in Mikola's childhood and his life as a whole. First of all as his father, but also as a wise and intelligent figure for Mikola to emulate. The Golden Order seal reads, a formless sacred seal depicting the ceremonial observation of order. Fundamentalism is scholarship in all but name, scales incantations using both intelligence and faith. Radagon was one of the leading experts in the Golden Order, and fundamentalism as a whole, and with this seal, we understand exactly what that means. Scholarship with a smattering of faith. And we know exactly how Radagon helped develop this way of thinking. The Radagon icon reads, A legendary talisman depicting the Elden Lord Radagon shortens the casting time of sorceries and incantations. As the husband of Renala of Caria, the red-haired Radagon studied sorcery, and as the husband of Queen Marika, he studied incantations. Thus did the hero aspire to be complete. A man of faith and intelligence, Radagon seemed like the perfect person to help fix Melania. Learning from both of his wives, he married two concepts that would theoretically be perfect to fix any affliction. Alongside this, Mikola very obviously cared for his father and enjoyed the time they spent together. Several of the Golden Order's ring incantations were created by Mikola, and this sheds an interesting light on him. Triple Rings of Light and Discus of Light both read, A gift from the young Mikola to his father Radagon. Not only did Mikola believe in the fundamentalism of the Golden Order, even if briefly, he helped build it with his father. Mikola was intelligent enough to not only meet his father intellectually, but even surpass him. And considering the Golden Order's power and strength as the dominant force, with a god queen and an Elden Lord in power, it would seem very reasonable that they would be able to help fix Melania's affliction. And yet, they were not able to. Golden Order fundamentalism, in its current form, was not sufficient in fixing her. Something about it was flawed, or perhaps impure. Mikola needed to go down other avenues to save his beloved sister. Radagon's Rings of Light reads, One of the incantation of the Golden Order Fundamentalists. A gift of gratitude to the young Mikola from his father Radagon, produces a golden ring of light and fires it across a wide area. And yet, the young Mikola abandoned fundamentalism, for it could do nothing to treat Melania's accursed rot. This was the beginning of unalloyed gold. Melania was running out of time. The rot was spreading, and the Golden Order's fundamentalism was doing nothing nothing to fix her. So Mikola left, taking the concept of fundamentalism and working on distilling it down into his own purified version. 
unalloyed gold. We know he still used his knowledge from his days working with the Golden Order, as the Clean Rot Knight's Halo Scythe has an art of war named Mikola's Ring of Light. It is functionally the Discus of Light incantation, but evolved ever so slightly. And while Mikola almost certainly moved on from the Golden Order to help his sister, there may indeed have been another reason as well, the way the Golden Order treated those who lived in death. I'll be talking about this soon in a video I'll be doing about Mikola, Godwin, and those who live in death. It's important to discuss what the word Empyrean actually means. As an adjective, it means relating to heaven or the sky, and as a noun, it can mean the highest part of heaven, thought by the ancients to be the realm of pure fire, or the visible parts of heaven and the sky. It has both Greek and Latin roots. The medieval Latin Empyreus, an adaptation of the Greek Empyros, meaning in or on the fire. This leads me to believe that Empyreans were intended to be seen as the highest form of demigods, or perhaps the purest form. Earlier in this video, I mentioned that Mikola and Melania were born of Queen Marika and Elden Lord Radagon. However, this particular phrasing may not be entirely accurate. The Remembrance of the Rot Goddess reads, Remembrance of Melania, Goddess of Rot, hewn into the Erd Tree. Mikola and Melania are both the children of a single god. As such, they are both Empyreans, but suffered afflictions from birth. One was cursed with eternal childhood, and the other harboured rot within. This not only confirms their afflictions, but also tells us a few important things. They were born of a single god, and they are Empyreans. It's very much up for debate whether or not you need to be born of a single god to be an Empyrean. During Rani's questline, she mentions that I was once an Empyrean, of the demigods. Only I, Mikola, and Melania could claim that title. Each of us was chosen by our own two fingers, as a candidate to succeed Queen Marika, to become the new god of the coming age, which is when I received Blythe, in the form of a vassal tailored for an Empyrean, but I would not acquiesce to the two fingers. I stole the rune of death, slew mine own Empyrean flesh, casting it away. I would not be controlled by that thing. It is obvious that the title of Empyrean is given to them by their two fingers, or the greater will itself, but perhaps being an Empyrean is something bound to a being's flesh considering Rani had to slay her own to escape the greater will and her fate. Rani herself is an odd outlier, as she is born of Radagon and Renala, which would leave her not born of one god. Also interestingly, during the intro cutscene when the narrator says, Marika's children, demigods all, Rani shows up. She is a demigod, as when Radagon married Marika, his children were all granted the title. But she is not a child of Marika, so this is very strange indeed. It is possible that she was born of Radagon and Marika during the time Renala was married to Radagon. Or in an even more unlikely version of this theory, she was born of the Rune of the Unborn, aka the Amber Egg Renala Clutches, as part of Radagon's gift on his departure. However, it's very possible that Rani is simply an example of how the title of Empyrean does not need you to be born of one god. Another example of this could be the Black Flame Ritual Incantation, which reads, Superior Black Flame Incantation of the Godskin Apostles. Summon a circle of black flame pillars around the caster. The gloam-eyed queen led the apostles. It's said that she was an Empyrean chosen by the fingers. Chosen by the fingers, just like Rani. Who this Empyrean could be is very much up to debate. Be it Melina, Marika, Rani, or a completely different being, that question is for another day, and likely its own video. Again, I emphasize that other Empyreans did exist, and the evidence is conflicting on whether you need to be born into it. So now we have an idea of what an Empyrean is, what is their purpose? Gary explains this when talking about Melania. Queen Marika and her king consort Radagon were blessed with twin demigods, and Melania was one of them. She was born an Empyrean carrying the Scarlet Rod. An Empyrean is no mere demigod. In the age of the Elden Ring and Queen Marika, the precious Empyrean was born, a new god to forge a new order. The purpose of these Empyreans is to become the new god after Marika, and take her place. They are also intended to forge a new order, not just uphold the last one. It's possible you must be an Empyrean to become a god. This is somewhat backed up by Marika being an Empyrean herself. 
We know she was an Empyrean due to the remembrance of Malekith, the Black Blade, which reads, Malekith was a shadow-bound beast given to his Empyrean. Marika's sole need of her shadow was a vessel to lock away destined death. Even then, she betrayed him. Malekith is Marika's shadow, and therefore, she herself was an Empyrean. She's one of the few figures we see reach godhood in the game. One of the other Empyreans becomes a god as well. This occurs when we fight Melania, and she becomes the goddess of rot. Another Empyrean becomes a god, however not by the conventional means of the greater will I'm sure. Speaking of which, slightly off topic, but I wish we had gotten an Age of Rot or an Age of Unalloyed Gold ending. I really wish we would have gotten a chance to see Mikola or Melania as the god of the coming age, rather than Marika's broken corpse. Perhaps these endings may become possible in DLC, but I find it unlikely. Back to the Black Blade Remembrance. Empyreans are also given shadows or shadow-bound beasts by the Two Fingers. I intend to talk about Mikola's and Melania's shadows in an upcoming video. Despite all of this, the fact remains that Mikola and Melania were born of a single god, and they were born of Radagon and Marika. This is because Marika and Radagon are the same being. We can discover this by casting the Law of Regression on a statue of Radagon in Leyendale. The statue then becomes a statue of Marika, and a message in front of it reads, Radagon is Marika. We also see this during the cutscene before Radagon's boss fight. Marika is crucified before falling and claiming her hammer. Her hair turns red and she becomes Radagon. This is also even alluded to in the intro cutscene, with Marika and Radagon switching places, Marika trying to shatter the Elden Ring and Radagon trying to mend it. With Marika and Radagon being one and the same, they are able to have children together, with those children being born of one singular god. It seems like Mikola and Melania took after different halves of Marika and Radagon. Mikola gained the golden hair of Marika, while Melania took the red hair of Radagon. Mikola and his sister also embody a form of duality in themselves. Mikola embodies life, purity, and progress, whereas Melania embodies death, corruption, and to some extent stagnation. Even their afflictions contradict eternal youth and eternal rot. The most fascinating part of this duality can be uncovered when we look deeper into both of these afflictions. Rot really embodies a form of change, a metamorphosis, in a rather macabre way, whereas eternal youth almost suggests a form of stagnation in itself. Just as interestingly as what they did with the time they were given. Mikola spent years stagnating trying to fix Melania and getting nowhere, whereas Melania learnt to become a water dancer to fight the stagnation of her rot. Yet perhaps the most curious aspect of all of this is how they both underwent a form of change, a metamorphosis, a rebirth of some kind and eventually they were both forced into a deep slumber because of it. Melania had her blooms at the Battle of Aeonia in Caelid, and her final battle with us, and Mikola cocooned himself in the Halig Tree, and then eventually was taken to the Mogwin Dynasty to slumber for all time. Speaking of cocoons, there are several types of butterfly that we can find around the game. These butterflies have very direct connections to Mikola and Melania, with the nascent and Aeonian varieties. The Aeonian butterfly reads, A butterfly with withered scarlet wings found in the swamp of Aeonia. According to myth, these butterflies were once the wings of the goddess of rot herself. When we fight Melania and bring her to her second phase, she does indeed turn into the goddess of rot and spouts a large number of butterflies from her wings. So these are definitely connected to her. They are also found exclusively around rot or places where she has spent significant amounts of time. The strange thing about butterflies is that not all of them drink nectar. In fact, some species, like the purple emperor, are known for drinking blood and the putrefied liquids of corpses. The nascent butterfly reads, an arcane butterfly with translucent wings, material used for crafting items, exceedingly rare to find. This butterfly appears as if it's just emerged from its cocoon for its entire life. When we find Mikola in the Mogwin dynasty, he is indeed in a cocoon, and the Halic tree itself hosts many of these cocoons. These butterflies, just like Mikola, would have an eternally youthful look, as they appear as if they have just escaped their cocoon. They would also appear to be extremely fragile, all of these things fitting quite perfectly with Mikola. Part of the duality that is intrinsic to the pair could run deeper still. There's a possibility that the reason Mikola and Melania were born afflicted 
created is due to them both being born of a single being, and therefore they were not whole. Or more accurately, they were born parts of the same whole. This butterfly theory could in fact suggest instead a trinity, as there is indeed a third butterfly. The smouldering butterfly reads, an eternally burning butterfly found near wildfires and elsewhere, serves as the kindling for a number of items. There is one character who is used as kindling during this game, unless you take the frenzied flame route, and that is Melina. All of these beings have an affliction of some kind. Rot, youth, and I believe in Melina's case, the lack of a physical body. Perhaps Melina could be connected far more intrinsically than we first thought. She does mention that she was born inside the Erd Tree, and there her mother gave her purpose, something she has now lost. Inside the Erd Tree is of course where we find Marika and then fight Radagon. Her brown hair could even be a mix of Radagon's red and Marika's gold. There's a lot of theories and speculation as to whether Melina is the gloam-eyed queen or even a part of Ronnie. And I believe these both still could be possible, even if she was a triplet or fully related to Mikola and Melania. Another more pressing question then becomes exactly how were the twins born, considering Radigan and Marika are physically in the same body. Now I do think there is a distinct chance that the Imperians' births are meant to represent a form of virgin birth, much like Jesus and his mother the Virgin Mary. However, I do think that there's another possibility here parthenogenesis, where an unfertilized egg becomes an embryo. Parthenogenesis could perhaps explain why Mikola seems so feminine. During this form of reproduction, usually only females are produced, mostly because the mother only has X chromosomes. Even more interesting is that the organisms born this way are usually very similar, if not genetically identical to their mothers. While parthenogenesis is found all across the animal kingdom, including some insects, it is extremely rare in butterflies and moths naturally. However, we can indeed induce it in the domestic mulberry silk moth, Bomboxy mori. Bomboxy mori's silk cocoons are extremely similar to the ones we can find around the Halic tree, and perhaps even the ones Mikola is found in himself. I must admit that this is a bit of a stretch at this point. This instance of parthenogenesis is induced by humans, and natural parthenogenesis in humans creates tumours and teratomas, not viable embryos. However, even considering this, the twins are not normal humans. They are demigods, or perhaps even more than that. It's also possible that Marika and Radagon's joining happened later in their lives. There is an odd quote that Melina says after you beat Morgoth. In Marika's own words, O oh Radigan, Leal hound of the Golden Order, thou art yet to become me. Thou art yet to become a god. Let us be shattered, both mine other self. If they were shattered, much like the Elden Ring, perhaps parts of themselves were broken off as a part of this process. And maybe those parts of themselves were Marika's more masculine aspects in Mikola and Radagon's more feminine in Melania. Then perhaps Melina is more of a mixture of the two that broke off alongside of them in a more spiritual form. Perhaps just as interestingly, parthenogenesis can also occur in ants. In the Deep Root Deaths, we can find an abundance of larger queen ants, with rather bulbous behinds. When defeated, they drop Numen runes. Numen runes read, grace that dwells within the inhabitants of the lands between, the lingering residue of gold. Used to gain 12,500 runes, the Numen are said to have come from outside the lands between, and are in fact of the same stock as Queen Marika herself. Marika, the mother of Mikola and Melania, is a Numen. The Numen, however, are not native to the lands between, and Marika's hammer also clarifies this for us. It reads, Stone hammer made in the lands of the Numen, outside the lands between, the tool with which Queen Marika shattered the Elden Ring and Radagon attempted to repair it. The hammer partially broke upon shattering the ring, becoming splintered with rune fragments. We do not come across any other Numens that we know of, except perhaps the Black Knife Assassins. Their armor reads, Scale armor used by the Black Knife Assassins, forged to make no sound. Traces of power yet remain in its concealing veil, which muffles the sound of footsteps. The assassins that carried out the deeds of the Knight of the Black Knives were all women and rumored to be Newman, who had close ties with Marika herself. So what exactly does this all mean? I think perhaps the ants found in the deep root depths could be birthing Newman. 
Perhaps even Marika has taken some of these ant-like traits and has birthed a pair of twins through parthenogenesis herself. But this theory could also be refuted quite easily. It is very possible the ants are simply scavenging Newman corpses, which is why they have so many Newman runes. There are indeed species of ants that have specialised workers that gorge on foods to the point they grow enlarged abdomens. These are often referred to as honeypot ants. They function as living larders for other ants. These larger Newman ants could easily be queens or honeypot ants, it's very hard to tell. However, this does not make Newmans irrelevant to Mikola. Marika being an Empyrean, just like I mentioned earlier, leaves a very strange question mark, as she was seemingly just born a Newman and chosen by the Greater Will. We have no information on her birth. She may too have been born from a singular god or entity, and there also may in fact simply be no relation between Newman and godhood. However, Newman means the spirit or divine power presiding over a thing or place, and in Latin it could mean divinity, divine presence, or divine will. Perhaps in other words, the Greater Will. Is it possible that the Newman came with the Greater Will and the Elden Beast? Maybe this could tell us that other lands are also ruled by an Elden Beast and the Greater Will. We do see many Erd trees in the back of the Elden Beast's arena. Even stranger, should we consider Mikola and Melania Newman considering their singular parentage? Maybe even Empyrean could simply mean a Newman chosen by the Greater Will, or someone who has a high concentration of Newman, or aka divine blood. This line of questioning leaves us with more questions than answers. Sadly, questions we'll find no answer to anytime soon. We do, however, know where FromSoft and George R. R. Martin likely found their inspiration for the Newman, the Numenorians from Lord of the Rings. They were tall, golden haired, and fair skinned, much like Marika. They came from another land an island across the sea named Numenor, and they age slower than most normal people. We can actually play a Numen, as it's one of the preset races in the character creator. The flavour text for it reads, The face of the Numen, supposed descendants of the denizens of another world, long lived but seldom born. And FromSoft have taken inspiration from Lord of the Rings before, with Anor Londo being Sindarin, one of the languages of the elves. It roughly translates to Sunhaven. As I mentioned earlier, the Golden Order had failed Mikola and his sister. It was impure and therefore could do nothing to help her affliction. So Mikola took matters into his own hands and made his own version of gold. Unalloyed gold means gold with no other metals or elements added to it. In this case, a gold that is not an alloy, so in other words, pure or 24 karat gold. Now pure gold is extremely interesting. It by itself is extremely unreactive and does not combine well with oxygen specifically, so it does not tarnish and it does not rust. It only tarnishes and rusts when combined with another metal to make an alloy. This almost by itself explains how pure, unalloyed gold would be a better fit for Mikola's goals than the Golden Order or another version of alloyed gold. In fact, when a normal alloy of gold, so not pure gold, oxidizes, it turns black. It's almost like it's rotted in a way. We've seen an example of this in Dark Souls with the rusted gold coin. This visual of pure gold not rusting does fit rather well with Mikola's unalloyed gold needle and the scarlet rot. By doing Millicent's questline, we can defeat Commander O'Neill in the Swamp of Aeonia. This needle was removed from Melania during her battle with Radan, and initially after acquiring it, it reads, an intricately crafted needle of unalloyed gold. Once snapped in half, it has been repaired by Sage Gowry. A ritual implement crafted to ward away the meddling of outer gods. It is thought to be capable of forestalling the incurable rotting sickness. Mikola's unalloyed gold not only didn't rot by itself, but could stall the progress of rot inside his sister Melania. This shows that Mikola was on the verge of success. It gave Mikola and Melania the time they needed to come up with a true cure, its biggest failing being that it by itself didn't cleanse the rot, it only halted it. After defeating and deflowering, or should I say flowering, Melania, Blade of Mikola, who has never known defeat, you can use this unalloyed gold needle to make Mikola's needle. It reads, one of the unalloyed gold needles that Mikola crafted to ward away the meddling of outer gods, capable of subduing the flame of frenzy if inherited, allowing one to cheat fate and avoid becoming the lord of frenzied flame. However, the needle is as yet unfinished and can only be used at the heart of the storm beyond time, said to be found in Faramazula. 
This is particularly interesting, because not only does it suggest that Mikola's unalloyed gold could be used to ward the influence of outer gods, such as the outer god of rot and the frenzied flame, but it could perhaps also be used to allow one to cheat fate. I'd hazard to say Mikola's goal was indeed to cheat fate. His own fate to be eternally youthful, and his sister's fate to be controlled by the outer god of rot. It's also extremely interesting to note that Mikola made multiple of these needles. This is just one of many. If Mikola had had more time, maybe he could have warded off all of the outer gods, including the greater will. The final question we have when it comes to needles is, where exactly did he come up with this idea? The answer is, once again, Radagon. At the Church of Vows, we can find the gold sewing needle next to the fabled turtle pope, Miriel Pastor of Vows. It reads, Sewing needle made of gold. Unique item made to alter demigod attire. One of the tools brought by Radagon when he entered into marriage with Renala, Queen of the Full Moon, and joined the Carrion Lion. Once again, Mikola's father plays a role in influencing his creations. Where Radagon used this needle purely for clothes, Mikola innovated and used this tool in medicine to help his sister. I should also point out that Radagon's seal, which we see across the game in many places, is a cross-hatching of sorts, which can easily be associated with needles and sewing. Finally, it should also be noted that in many cultures, needles are seen as a symbol of purity, much like Mikola. Pure gold does, however, have other possible connections to real-world symbolism. Since 600 BC, humanity has been using gold as a currency, mostly for its malleability and ease of casting, but also its durability. Gold can be easily formed into whatever you want, and it will stay like that for an extremely long time. Alchemists believe gold to be the purest form of noble metal, and believed it could be made of other metals or substances such as sulfur and lead by studying the ways of alchemy enough. Alongside this, gold was sometimes associated with finding eternal youth through the Philosopher's Stone. There are even some connections to gold being edible or drinkable, perhaps as an elixir of life. Those that would eat or drink this would be given eternal youth and be cleansed of diseases. I believe Mikola is intended to literally be a form of this elixir of life. He not only brought life to the Halig tree itself by watering it with his blood, but he also brought life to the many people who made a great pilgrimage to get there, including the Albanorix and the Misbegotten. He exists just as a symbol of hope, just as much as he does a real person. And as soon as Moog absconded with him, the Halig tree and all those who lived on and around it fell to chaos and rot. I definitely believe there is more to this particular connection when it comes to alchemy and gold, something perhaps that I am missing. If you have any particular thoughts on this, please leave a comment. I'm intrigued to see what you have to say. If you are interested in learning more about alchemy and how it could be connected to Elden Ring, I suggest watching Zeo Storm's video and then Matt Derrett's video on the subject. While their videos aren't particularly on Mikola per se, they are extremely interesting. Those links are in the description. The connections between gold and alchemy, however, don't just end here. There are many connections in alchemy to gold representing the sun. As I first mentioned in my video on Moog, Mikola could have been intended to become a blood sun, and I believe these ideas could lend even more so to that theory. The symbol for gold in alchemy is often referred to as the sun, and the sun is often equated to the male form and gold. Mikola somewhat fits all of these parameters, but he also has a connection to the sun if somewhat tenuous in the cult of Sol, literally meaning cult of the sun. While they deal more in the eclipse, I believe their version of the eclipse could have been related to Mikola's metamorphosis. I will be talking about them more when I talk about Godwin in the eclipse in another video. Back to alchemy. The other forms of the symbol for gold that I've found look more obviously like the sun, except perhaps this one, which looks a lot more like a falling star. The interesting part here is that gold does actually come from stars. The gold on planet Earth came here from outer space, and that is because the only natural way to form gold is through supernovae and neutron star collisions. Every single piece of gold we can find on Earth would have landed on Earth via meteorites, aka falling stars, later in Earth's development, otherwise it would have all sank to the core. This is because gold is four times more dense than iron and twice as dense as nickel, both of which make up the majority of the Earth's core. The Elden Stars incantation reads, This legendary incantation is the most ancient of those that derive from the Erd Tree. Creates a stream of golden shooting stars that assail the area. It is said that long ago the Greater Will sent a golden star bearing a beast into the lands between, which would later become the Elden Ring. The creation of gold and the Golden Order literally came from a star dropped upon the lands between. 
The Elden Beast itself came from beyond, a gift from the Greater Will. The coloration of the Elden Beast and the Elden Ring are visually golden. It's therefore quite interesting to consider that maybe the reason why the unalloyed gold needle is able to quell the meddling of outer gods is because it too is a relic from beyond the lands between, or perhaps even a relic from an outer god. It would be perfectly suited to counter their influence. Perhaps, perhaps becoming a god could mean that Mikola takes on the Elden Ring, becoming more star-like, or falling star-like, similar to Marika who we see at the end of the game. Or with the influence of an outer god, they might physically become a sun in the sky. The age of the Erd Tree is coming to an end, and we know that the Erd Tree did take over the Great Tree in the first place. Perhaps an age of Mikola would mean the end of the Erd Tree altogether, the Erd Tree that eclipses the sun. But despite all of this, despite Mikola's potential, despite how close he was, in the end Mikola was taken by Moog. His plans never came to fruition, and his goals were never achieved. It's almost poetic how he and Moog ended up in the same place, as powerless as one another, while his sister slept, waiting for his return. As mentioned in the Remembrance of the Rot Goddess, Melania and Mikola had afflictions. Eternal youth and eternal rot. But why? The most obvious answer, and one that George R. R. Martin has written about before, is incest. Or perhaps in this case we should call it self-cest. The question of whether Marika and Radagon are genetically identical is not easy to answer. They do have different traits, the obvious one being the hair, which we would normally attribute to genetics. However, they are obviously the same person, so it may come down to a lack of genetic diversity, or Mikola and Melania missing specific chromosomes due to their singular parentage. Martin has written a lot about incest in the Song of Ice and Fire book series, be that multiple Targaryen pairs, Cersei and Jaime Lannister, or Craster and his keep of debauchery. The majority of these cases go very, very poorly in the long run. The concept of keeping blood pure in that series also ties very well into this, and perhaps that was the thinking when Marika birthed the twins. They are some of the few Empyreans that would be able to follow in her footsteps as a god. Or maybe she didn't even want them. Perhaps the Greater Will or Radagon forced them upon her. If we go down another possible path, rather than a more physical scientific answer, Marika and Radagon could have made a more spiritual faux pas. Muriel mentions when talking about Renala, you would do well to remember, severing a vow, strongest of bonds, has consequences ever more dire. Not one, but two vows were broken for Marika and Radagon to get together. These were the vows between Marika and Godfrey, and then Radagon and Renala. Perhaps a cosmic force punished them for their transgressions. Perhaps that cosmic force was the greater will itself. I think it's very likely that the Greater Will intended to punish Radagon for choosing Renala in the first place, perhaps going against its own will. It seems that Radagon did indeed love Renala, considering the gift he left her with, the Amber Egg, aka the Rune of the Unborn. Also bear in mind that this rune, this egg, was given to Renala before the Elden Ring was shattered, before Marika was crucified in the Erd Tree. It's obvious that Radagon and Marika didn't really love each other either. They had very conflicting views on the shattering of the Elden Ring, at least. The Greater Will, perhaps, was playing matchmaker, and then was angered when its puppets didn't play along. Or perhaps it's just the influence of Outer Gods. The Outer God of Rot obviously influenced Melania, and maybe Mikola was influenced by the Formless Mother, or another Outer God, maybe one of Gold. Considering the cosmic origins of Gold, it may be another unseen Outer God that had its claws in Mikola this entire time. That is pure speculation. It's also considerably unlikely considering his own needle warding away outer gods. I get the feeling that Mikola didn't really like any of the outer gods, including the Greater Will. Whereas the influence of the outer god of Rot on Melania is obvious. She is less than a shadow of her former self. Her flesh dull gold and her blood rotted, waiting for her brother's return. Some people attribute the amount she mentions, I am Melania, blade of Mikola, to her own hubris but maybe it was simply a way of keeping what's left of her memory, preventing it all from rotting away. An affirmation of who she is, or who she was, before the rot took everything. There is so much more to talk about, but I'll have to leave the majority of that for another day. The next video will be on St. Trina, Dreams and the Halic Tree. 
I truly want to thank all of you so much for watching. It genuinely, truly means the world to me. Again, please do comment if you have any thoughts. I try to read every single one of them. Thanks once again to Muse for all the wonderful art they have done for this channel and to Savonic for the banner he created as well. You can find them at Muse underscore Avocado and at Savonic. And you can find me at Rage Akari on Twitter. I won't keep you any longer. As a monstrous man once said, 